It's a pleasure to see this crowd here this evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Kenneth Yalowitz. I'm the director of the Dickey Center for International Understanding. And I'm very, very pleased to welcome all of you uh, to our winter term uh, lecture and our Great Issues series of lectures. I think you know every term we sponsor a lecture by a distinguished guest on a particularly important topic. And certainly the theme, the topic that we'll be exploring tonight, uh, genocide, is, is certainly one of the most troubling and one of the most important issues facing the world today. This uh, event tonight is a very special one, and I'm very pleased that it's being co-sponsored by a number of other organizations uh, at Dartmouth, in addition to the Dickey Center. They include uh, Dartmouth Hillel, uh, Jewish Studies, the Ethics, Ethics Institute, and the Office of Institutional Diversity uh, and Equity. I would also want to thank very much uh, the very hardworking and loyal staff members of Hillel and the Dickey Center for some extraordinary uh, efforts over the uh, last few days. I know it's been, uh, it's been quite an effort. The world today is a very complicated place. On the one hand, we're coming closer together as a result of global communications, transportation, trade, all of the things that we call globalization. At the same time, we're being pulled apart in a number of ways uh, at the same time. We have divisions between rich and poor. We have divisions between those are, who are healthy and those who are not. The terrible problems of malaria, tuberculosis, AIDS remain un unresolved. <clears throat> These are obviously very, very serious and important issues, but one of the things that pulls us apart today, above all, are the ethnic and territorial uh, conflicts and genocides, mass murder. Our speaker tonight is going to help us to understand why genocides can happen why there may or may not be interventions by the United Nations and the international community as in the case of Rwanda. And perhaps most importantly is what can one individual do when faced with evil? I believe our speaker tonight is one who is singularly well placed to help us try to answer and investigate those issues and I would now like to ask Rabbi Edward Boraz, the rabbi of the uh, Hillel Dartmouth, Dartmouth Hillel, to introduce our speaker tonight, Rabbi Boraz. Um, before I begin my introduction, um, first, I just want to say that the turnout here tonight and last night uh, really represents, I think, the best of what Dartmouth is and its sensitivities. And I hope and I pray and I say this with some confidence that after tonight's lecture discussion that we will in some way be transformed to relieve some of the suffering that that is in the world. Before I begin my introduction, I want to extend our deepest thanks to former ambassador to Belarus and Georgia, Kenneth Yalowitz, and the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding for co-sponsoring tonight's lecture, and particularly his outstanding staff that has made a number of these arrangements. I also want to extend my deepest thanks to members of the Hillel Student Board, including Michelle Schwartz, Brian Myers, Jeremy Warburg, Jake Anderson, Yardina Beamer, and Meredith Drus, and especially to my administrative assistant, Claudia Palmer, and Ethan Levine, my associate executive director, for helping with so much of the arrangements. 
I also want to acknowledge the co-sponsorship of Jewish studies under the leadership of Professor Susanna Heschel, the Ethics Institute under the direction of Dr. Ronald Green, and the Office of Institutional Diversity and Equity under the guidance of Ozzie Harris. Ten years ago, as the country of Rwanda descended into madness, one man made a promise to protect the family he loved and ended up finding the courage to save over 1,200 people. Over the course of 100 days, almost one million people were killed in Rwanda. Hotel Rwanda, of which I am told close to 1,800 people saw that film last night here, tells the inspiring story of our guest tonight, Mr. Paul Rusesa Begina, a modest man, a hotel manager in Rwanda, who used his courage to shelter over a thousand refugees from certain death. Ms. Mr. Rusesa Begina was born on June 15, 1954, in central south Rwanda. His parents were farmers. In 1962, he entered the Seventh-day Adventist College of Gitwe, a missionary school, and was there for seven years of primary school and six years of secondary study. From 1975 to 1978, Mr. Rusesa Begina attended the Faculty of Theology in Cameroon, and in January of 1979 was employed by Sabina as a front office manager in their newly opened hotel Akagira in the Akagira National Park. It was at this time he learned about the tourism, hotel, and catering industry. Through the Swiss Tourist Consult, Mr. Rusesa Begina's application was accepted for entrance into the Kenya Utali College in Nairobi in the hotel management course, which he started in early 1980 and finished in September 1984 in Switzerland. Back from Switzerland, Mr. Rusesa Begina joined Sabina Hotels again and was employed as an assistant general ma manager in the Mill Colleen Hotel from October of 1984 until November of 1993, at which time he was promoted to the general manager of the Diplomat Hotel, also in Kigali. For the 100 days of the genocide, Mr. Rusesa Mr. Rusesa Begina had to move back to the Milkolin Hotel. His colleague Bick, manager of that unit, left Kigali on April 11, 1994, despite the number of ref refugees that were still left on their own. It was the next morning when the government left Kigali, Mr. Mr. Rusesa Begina, uh, um, excuse me, that the interim government left Kigali for Gitarama. Mr. Rusesa Begina was there for almost the entire span of the genocide. When the massacre slightly calmed down in July of 1994, Bick came back and joined his unit, and Mr. Rusesa Begina went back to the Diplomat Hotel, where he stayed until September of 1996, after which he went to Belgium as a refugee. From that time to date, Mr. Rusesa Begina has worked first as a businessman, and he owns a transport company. But now, of course, he is principally involved in spreading his very important message and lessons for us to learn. He's involved in charitable organizations aiding survivors of the Rwanda tragedy and is in the process of, of setting up a foundation in his name for further assistance. Mr. Rusesa Begina served as special, con as special consultant to United Artists and Lionsgate's film production of of Hotel Rwanda. And after listening to him at his press conference and having dinner with him, um, there is one word that comes to my mind from my tradition, and it is the word lechayim, which means to life. And you are a celebration of life. Please welcome Mr. Paul Rusesa Begina. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Tonight, I'm very delighted to be with you and share with you a few experiences. But I came with my wife, my partner, Mrs. Ruse Sabagina, who is sitting there. She can just greet you. Please greet the people. <clears throat> Thank you very, very much for such a warm welcome. I have decided tonight to tell you the real life behind Hotel Rwanda, the movie you saw last night. Hotel Rwanda is a real story of what took place in that country about a decade ago. But before talking to you about that, I would like to give you a background of the Rwandan story, because most other people do not know what a Hutu means, what a Tutsi means. Before Rwanda became a German colony, late 1800s, Hutu, Tutsis, and Batwa because actually we are three groups, but there is one who is not really talked about. Those are just 1%, and Tutsis 14%, and Hutus about 85. Those people existed in that country. They knew each other, what they were, but that was not a problem. When the colonizers came in, there was no way to enter in that, in that society because all Rwandese do speak the same language. We share the same culture. We are all of us mixed all over the country. And there has been also an intermarriage. Therefore, it was not really easy for someone to rule over such a nation in order to divide them so that they could rule. They started saying that Tutsis were more intelligent, more clever, more closer to white. And that was one of the good reasons why they have even been made to rule. In 1923, Germans lost the, uh, the First World War. When they lost, Rwanda was given to Belgium as a protectorate. Unfortunately, the Belgians themselves did not take time and change any single thing about what was going on in that country. They thought that that would be maintained forever. Instead of changing, they rather, in 1935, when they put up the first IDs or mentioned that this one is a Hutu, the other one is a Tutsi, and these people are very different. They even happened to measure the noses and the fingers to see who was a Hutu and who was a Tutsi, which was a mistake. Because a Hutu who could have cows could become a Tutsi. And a Tutsi without cows 
was Ahutu. Actually in Kinyarwanda, Ahutu means someone who works for someone else. And that was all. 1959, that was what they called the Hutu Revolution. The Hutu Revolution did never bring anything new, positive. It only brought up the first exodus of Tutsis and 200,000 people went, uh, went outside. Of course, it was a kind of coup against colonizers. Europeans went to Europe, <coughs> and their partners who ruled with them just hung, hung around in their neighboring countries, in Uganda, Burundi, Congo, Tanzania, and so on. Early 80s, they joined the rebellions, the liberation movements. In 1979, they overthrew Idi Amin Dada in 1986. In January, they brought Museveni to power. 1990, it was a war. But in the meantime, the first exodus was not the, on, was not the only one. In 1973, we saw a lot of our friends, our colleagues, children being kicked out of schools going to Burundi, going to Congo, going to Uganda, and this became a national shame. 1990, before the war broke out, it was all the same. When the war broke out, wherever the rebels passed, they killed innocent civilians. On the other side, the government, the leaders of a nation, created a militia which, was, which started also butchering people in Kigali, the capital, in the eastern Rwanda, Bugesera, in the Murambi, Byumba, and also some Bagogues in the north, Gisenyi, were murdered. Many of us were very much scared. We were willing to run away. Other people, other nation, the whole nation was shaken. Politicians in opposition were being murdered here and there. Many innocent people in the bars were being killed by grenades. You could hear that last night in some places of Kigali, 20 people have been killed. Most of the people who wanted to run away again as we have been used to, didn't do it because the United Nations inspired us that confidence. We saw 2,500 soldiers with a Canadian general as their leader and thought that this was the best. Nobody, no Rwandese, could kill a neighbor in front of a foreigner. We wanted all of us to run away, but we didn't do it because we were sure that at least once peace 
had come. I remember I was giving this example a few minutes ago. I happened to have a manager's meeting in Europe. I went to Europe. I took my wife and my son. We attended that meeting. After the meeting, we took a short while, moved around. And on the 30th of March, we took a flight back to Rwanda. Well, when we arrived, we went back to our house. That was a week before the genocide broke out. On April the 6th, in the evening, I was having dinner with my brother-in-law and his wife. I do not know why, don't remember why my wife didn't join us. We used to stay not far from the airport. When the presidential plane was shut down, my wife who was home, called me and said, Paul, please come back home. I have heard something I've never heard before. What is it? I do not know. Rush and come back. And tell Thomas and his wife to go home. My brother know. For those who have seen the film, you have seen the Tony says to my wife, those are their children. The other one was two years, her sister was nine months when their parents were killed. I took my car. I went home, and they also took theirs and went home as well. That was the end of our family party. We separated. I never saw them anymore. They were killed and never found. I went, to home, I went home, and when I arrived home, big the vehicle link manager was phoning. When they opened the gate, the phone was ringing. They told me that big ones wanted to talk to me. He told me, listen, rush and come back to town. We were staying a, a little bit far in the suburb. Rush and come back home. I was to town, sorry, to the hotel. Your president has been killed. We do not know what to follow. I was a little bit scared. And I phoned my friends at the United Nations and said, please, come and help me. I need escort to go back to the hotel. I remember. The people, the Bangladeshi soldiers I talked to, they told me, listen, Paul, they are killing people everywhere along the streets. They are asking them IEDs and murdering them. We, can, we are stranded at the Meridian Hotel. We can't move. Do your, does your house have two doors? If they come in one, you go out in the other one. The message was clear, as if those guys did not know that houses had, had two entrances or more. I was stuck at home for three days. The next day, 26 people came to my house. I can never call them strangers, but it was almost that. They were just neighbors. On the 9th, 
of April, around midday, I saw soldiers climbing my gate. And when I saw them climbing my gate, one of the refugees who were with us, an old man, told me, a neighbor, immediate neighbor, told me, listen, Paul, these people are looking for me. They know I have brought three sons with the rebels. It is me they are looking for. Let me go out so that they can kill me before killing you and the whole family. I told him, Michelle, whoever comes to my house is not looking for you, but rather for me. Let me go admit them. I went out. All the people were in meals, praying. I saw that uh, the way they were climbing, I said, listen, gentlemen, you do not need to climb. I'm there to open for you. I opened the gate outside. I saw two jeeps with uh, 20 soldiers. Then they told me that the government, the interim government, has sent us to evacuate you and bring you to the hotel because we need you. I said, okay, very good. But I cannot leave my family behind. You can see the situation. They said, okay, bring everybody. <coughs> everybody gathered in the hotel van and my neighbor's car. We rushed. And at about two kilometers away, I saw the jeep which was ahead of us pulling to the side of the, of the road and also showing me a sign to pull to the side of the road. And my neighbors behind also did the same. We were 32 people and 20 soldiers. All the soldiers jumped out and came to me. I remember one who was their leader, a captain came to me and said, Sir, we hear your manager. He said, yes. And all along the street, we could see dead bodies. He told me, but you know, do you know that other managers in this country have killed them? I said, no. If you do not know for information, we have killed them all. And you traitor, you are lucky. We are not killing you today. Because we need you. The government sent us to pick you up and bring you to the hotel. He handed me a country call. A Russian made gun and told me, have this gun and kill all of your cockroaches who are there. <coughs> In the film, you can see that this scene happened already <coughs> in the hotel's compound. This is not what happened. It was much more worse than what you can see on the screen. I couldn't tell him anything. <clears throat> I stayed there for about five minutes. But I watched him. After five minutes, I pointed out that old man who was with me and told him, listen, my friend, are you sure the enemy of fighting is this old man. Are you sure the enemy you are fighting is this baby? I know you guys are tired. 
you are stressed by the world, you are thirsty. But we can we can treat such a problem, such a problem otherwise. We can find another solution. We come down, started the negotiation. At the end, we came, we came to a compromise. <coughs> After two hours of negotiating, they took us to the hotel. And they had taught me one of the best lessons I had never learned before in my life, how to deal with the devil. I stayed in that hotel for three days with the government, and on the 12th of April, the government at 7 in the morning, when I went out, I saw the government all the people rushing up and down, gathering everything, ready to run away. I told my wife and all the refugees that these people are leaving. Then you get ready, we are going with them. My wife got ready, but I left the refugees in the manager's house as a diplomat. We followed them. We were just with them. Armored cars in front and ahead of us. When I arrived at the Mikulin, which was on the way, I turned left. I entered the Mikulin. At the entrance, the protectors of the hotel, since the manager had left the previous day on the 11th, with the militia. They had, they had just put a roadblock. There was no security at all, and yet, there were about 400 refugees in that hotel. I took my phone. I contacted other people I knew in the army. At the end of the day, I got the roadblock removed and five gendarmes to ensure the security of the house. That was the first step. But when I arrived, before I came, my colleague, when he was evacuated, he gave the keys to the receptionist. I had left my colleague in November 19. One and a half years before. <coughs> Getting back those keys, negotiating with those people who had occupied the best rooms of the hotel with their friends was another kind of task. But as you, you have seen in the film, I even happened to ask for a letter appointing me as the, as the general manager of the Mikulin Hotel. And then immediately, a few minutes later, they sent me a letter, this time appointing me as the general manager of all the Samina interests in the whole country. <laughs> I was, in any case, I was the only manager General manager remaining in the country, and I was the only African manager in the whole company. I was going to stay in that island of fear, located in a big sea of fire for quite a for quite a long time to me 
that was centuries. With a lot of bad experiences. On the 23rd of April, to be a little bit brief, I spent my day, 22nd, the whole day, night, on the 23rd, in the morning, at about 4 a.m., I went to sleep. When I fell asleep around 6, <coughs> I was woken up. Militia, soldiers, with the, any gun, any weapons you can think of. <coughs> Machetes, clubs, were guns, military uni in military uniforms, in the militia uniforms, all surrounding the hotel. A very cool voice told me, "Sir," I said, "Yes." I know that from the man, from, from the Ministry of Education, of uh, defense. Get out all of the people who are in these hotels for the next 30 minutes. I just sadly asked him, but sir, you know all the people who are in this house are refugees. If I tell them to leave, I tell them that they are going where? They are going out. Who is taking them? Where is he taking them? What security has been organized for them? They, they, they told me, right, did you really understand what you meant? I said, maybe I didn't. If you didn't, tell them to go as they came. I said, now, the message is decoded. As they came, means if they came hiding, bleeding because they have been Having no pieces, that is the way they wanted them to go. I just rushed to the roof of the hotel. I saw for a run. I my eyes. I came back down, running. I took my phone. I called the whole country, I think, within 30 minutes. I saw the general, the, the assistant general, uh, assistant general, chief of staff, uh, coming to the hotel, <coughs> getting all of those people out. That was another experience. There were so many more. Among others, you have seen the evacuation. When, we, when people were evacuated from the hotel. That was on 3rd of May at 5.30. The United Nations oh, okay. Yes. The United Nations the rebels and the army came to an agreement that Refugees from the Mikolin Hotel and those refugees who were, the Mikolin Hotel was on the government side and the National Stadium was on the rebels' side. So they came to an agreement that those refugees who want to go to the government side from the stadium could be exchanged with the Mikolin refugees who wanted to go to the rebels' side? All the Mikolin refugees wanted, wanted to go to the rebels' side. Some people were evacuated, at least to a man. My name was on the list. Because my wife was there, my children were there, but not mine as Paul. Many refugees came to me and said, listen, Paul, 
If you are leaving today, please let us know. We wouldn't wish to be chopped into pieces. If you are leaving, let us know so that we can go to the roof of the hotel and jump. That is a better death. During that time, the problem was no more to die. Most of the people were ready to die. But the problem was how, when, where. Many people paid to be killed, to be shot. So I told them, listen, I'm not leaving. They insisted, but please, we hear you're leaving. I said, no, I'm not leaving. The previous night, I sat with my wife and children and told them that I was not leaving. They said, no way. You are leaving with us. We can leave you behind. I looked at them and said that, listen, all of this you can see one day will come to an end. And the day all of this will come to an end. And if I leave, happen to leave these people and they are killed, I will never feel free. I'll always be a prisoner of my own conscience. Why do you think that one day when this, all of this will be over, I will tell history? Because I'll have to face history. Why do you think that the day I face history, I'll have to say? They ended up leaving. I watched them off. And there is a real footage which was done by the United Nations that day watching my family, taking them to the tracks. I saw them off. It was a very hard decision to be made. A few minutes, when the, the last truck was leaving, the radio, the RTLM, was already reading the names of all the people who were being evacuated. That was the role of a composite called Grégoire you have seen in Hotel Rwanda. Actually, there was not only one Grégoire, there were so many. I heard the names being read, including my son, who was one and a half years old, a young baby, saying that even that cockroach is escaping, he's joining other cockroaches, and in coming by, he's going the other side of the red line, and coming to attack again, a baby coming to attack. Dehumanizing people, calling them cockroaches through the media, conveying a message to the people to kill. A government leaders killing its own people through the media. And to convey a message to Rwandese through the media, the radio especially, because all Rwandese, Rwandese do never read newspapers. They can't afford. The papers are expensive. But each and every person has got a small radio, a transistor, to listen to the news, to get the message. These people were beaten, almost killed. Lucky enough, I can say, which was not a lack as such. A militia happened to shoot a soldier. And the soldiers started saying, started saying that militia are killing us. They started fighting themselves. 
That is when the intern, some of them were taken, not even intern, back to the trucks and brought back to the Mikolin. My wife, you can see there, was no more able to move. She was thrown in the truck. When she arrived, she was bleeding, lying in blood. I went, I took her to the room. She stayed for two weeks, unable to move. That was another experience that one can never forget in life. There are so many experiences like that. Around the 26th of May came another sign of hope for the terrified refugees of the Mikolin. That sign of hope was another evacuation, which was scheduled for the 27th. My friends came to me, my friends who were refugees also in the hotel, which I, I had tried to contact many times from their houses, and they couldn't, they couldn't, they didn't want to take up, to take the phone, and I insisted. But it happened when they were short of everything, food, drinks, everything. The woman said, I'm going to pick up this phone. The husband said, no, no way. If you pick this phone up, these people are coming and kill us. She said, if they come, they will kill us. But if they don't, still, we'll die. Because we don't have anything to drink, we don't have anything to eat. They came to me and said, listen, we are being evacuated tomorrow. Why can't you come with us? Because if you stay in this place, these people will kill you. They know that they will never kill these refugees. Unless they kill you first. They know you are their protector. You are the, the obvious target. I told them that so far, I had shown a sign that I'm a neutral person. I'm not for the government, for the army. I'm neither for the rebels. If I happen to go, I'll have shown my side. I might even be killed on the way. And all the people who would remain in this place are going to be killed. Why do you think that one day, when I face history, I will have to explain? They told me, but let your wife and children come with us. And for sure, my wife wanted to leave. She had been tortured enough. I said, no, if she go, wherever she'll go, I'll have shown my, the, the side where I stand. The first time I accepted, because people were supposed to be evacuated and brought to many other different countries. And this time, they are being evacuated to go to the rebel side. We sat together and decided that we're going to make, to do what we call in Kenya Rwanda, a blood brotherhood. We are going to become brothers. You, you are going to be evacuated as we are going to stay. We might die before, but we won't die, all of us. That was our hope. You might also die, but you won't die, all of you. Whoever remains was supposed to take care of all the children remaining. 
Other parents, we said, might be killed. And whoever, elder child, would remain, would take care of the young ones. That night, we united, joined our hands, and prayed. And the next morning, they were evacuated, and they left the hotel. We stayed in such a hell where the genocide was killing an average of 10,000 people per day during 100 days. About a million people were killed. A million people was about 15% of the people of the whole nation. It was unbelievable. And the whole, whole world had closed ears, eyes, turned backs, and ran away, left on our own. In the meantime, I continued, insisted, phoned, sent faxes, negotiated, phoned magazines, newspapers, radios abroad, telling them what was going on so that at long last we might end up getting help. We waited, but nothing. On the 17th of June, in the morning, I met the mayor of Kigali. And when, when, when we were talking, we learned that the militia were killing refugees who had gathered in a church at about 500 meters from the Mikolin Hotel, just very near. That day, they killed about 150 people. And I knew what was going on. I told him, Colonel, I need soldiers to take care of this hotel. He told me, you know, Paul, I don't have soldiers. All the soldiers are going to fight. Others are taking care, ensuring security of the official buildings. I looked at him. I almost fainted. Innocent people are being butchered, and you people are taking care of official buildings? He was a kind of offended. He left. But I had an appointment with the, his boss, General Bizimungu. As you have seen in Hotel Rwanda, I was with General Bismungu in the diplomat cellars, giving him some drinks, negotiating, dealing. When I heard that those militiamen, after killing the civilians, the refugees in the St. Famille church, came up to Mikolin, and they were entering the hotel. I told him, listen, General, let us go down to Mikolin. We immediately came down to Mikolin, and he was the one who saved the refugees. As you have seen in Hotel Rwanda, my wife was hiding in the bathroom with the children, unable, powerless, unable to do anything. The militiamen came and broke the door. They saw we were staying in a suite. They saw the um, living. They went to the, bed, to the bedroom. There was nobody. They opened the toilet, which was wide open. They couldn't see anyone. They, ra they rushed. Fortunately, they never checked what was in the bathroom. I came rushing, looking for them. When, I heard, when they heard my voice, that is when 
and they came out of their place where they were hiding. The same evening, the United Nations, the rebels again and the army came to an agreement that those people should be evacuated immediately. I told them that, listen, history keeps on repeating itself and does never give us a lesson. The previous time we tried to evacuate people in the evening and they were almost all of them killed and lucky enough, no one died. This time, why can't we wait? Give me soldiers. But please, do wait until tomorrow morning. I had removed all the, 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 the door numbers before in order to confuse everybody. All those doors were no more closing because they were all them broken. Give me soldiers who will come and protect these people for one night. The film has been so generous to the United Nations that we have shown the United Nations soldiers in the hotel, in the uniforms, as protecting, if they were protecting the building, which was not true. They only came for that night. And afterwards, they, they went away. About three or four of them came and spent a night. The generals gave me some soldiers, and everybody was evacuated. In the meantime, people were being butchered all over the country. We saw people killing people, killing dead bodies, making roadblocks sitting on them, drinking beers. We saw a lot of horror in that country. The next day, the Mikulin refugees were evacuated and taken to a place which is about 25 kilometers away. And two weeks, two weeks after, I came back to the Mikulin and Diplomat Hotel, I opened Ari, I started cleaning them, and I reopened them. On the 12th, to have an idea of what has been going on in the whole country. On the 12th of July, I drove south. Going to my place, going to see what was remaining at my wife's home. When we arrived, the houses had been destroyed. My mother-in-law was killed with her daughter-in-law and six grandchildren. We sat in the ruins, and yet we were seeing the bricks of the houses in neighbor's compound. I sat down, I remember crying and said that if I had a gun, I could have killed someone. It is only that time that I learned that a human being can be wild and much more wild than animals or the jungles. Animals kill because they're hungry, because they want to eat. But a human being kills just for killing. That is, when, that is when I started seeing that I will never no more trust. I'll suspect it in every person, and I won't trust anyone anymore, including my own friends. I was disappointed. But I never gave up. To be brief, ladies and gentlemen, what happened in Rwanda is still happening 
elsewhere in the world. There are so many parallels between what is, hap what is happening in Darfur to date and what took place in Rwanda 11 years ago. In Rwanda 1994, we had 1.5 million refugees within their country who actually did not even have the right to be called refugees because a refugee is someone who goes outside his country. To date, you've got 1.6 million innocent civilians who have fled their own villages in the Darfur, in Sudan. 3,000 villages have been completely destroyed. 220,000 people are refugees in Chad, sleeping on the Sahara sun, feeling the Sahara dust day and night, without shelter, without water, without food, without even firewood. I went to Darfur about a month ago. I saw how those people were surviving. I saw many children, many young people like you, some of you, who have got no hope in the for the future. Most of them, when they saw us, they demonstrated, many of them. They had a blackboard on which they wrote, welcome to our guest, but please, we need education. There are so many hopeless people in this world. When I think about what is going on since 1996 in the Congo, it is unbelievable. A situation whereby 3.8 million, according to the United Nations report, have been killed since 1996, I can believe in. And yet, even the media do no more talk about that. Africa is a forgotten case. When I think about the northern Uganda, where people call themselves the army of God, have been killing, butchering innocent civilians. When I think about countries like Somalia, which, which is the only country in the world without a government, ladies and gentlemen, Africa is becoming a forgotten case. In Rwanda, the statistics are that half a million children were left behind by the genocide as orphans. Many women have been raped, some of them with the AIDS. Others have got unwanted children. All of those children need education. They need medical care. They need psychological care. They need you. I have tried to help some of those people on my own, but I couldn't. I couldn't go very far. Because with my limited means, I can't help many. And yet, paying education, because education is the only weapon we can use to help raise up the, next, the future generations, it is not very expensive. About $200 can pay school fees for a child for almost a year. But how many children can one on his own help? That is a question. But I believe that a team can always make do a lot. I have put up 
a foundation in my own name called Ruse Sabagina Foundation. That foundation has got objectives of helping such people. First of all, starting from Rwanda, and at the end, also extending to many other places. That is a short-term help. Some people do ask me that what can we do? To do is not to give education only. It's not to help those people homeless, made homeless by their neighbors. It's also changing the situation. Rwanda needs to reconcile. Rwandese need to sit around a table. And we'll never make it unless the international community helps us. Chad, uh, uh, Sudanese will never unite unless they are forced because at this, at this tape, they only have to be forced. How to do, how to force them? What can you do? What you, do, what you can do is what Americans did about 20 years ago. The American people, you fought apartheid and you won. Today, all of those African dictators have got their assets in the Western countries. Raise awareness. Tell the lawmakers, the policymakers, that those people, they have got assets here. And their assets, they can be frozen. And they feel that they also can be touched one day. They are not untouchable. Those people are, expo are, are exporting oil. Why can't we, through a mass reaction, tell our policymakers that the, we, sh we can put an embargo on oil exportation? Why can't we ask the policymakers to put those guys on trial? Ladies and gentlemen, we can do a lot if we really want. You, young people, you are the next generation. You are the leaders of tomorrow. Tomorrow belongs to you. The whole world is yours. You can shape it the way you want. If you want it to be better, it will. If you want it to be the way it is, it will remain the way it is. And I can assure you, you can make it if you really want. Are you willing to? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we will be glad to take some questions. I think there are some microphones on the sides if I can see. Uh, I would ask that we're gonna give preference to students. So please students uh, come up first to ask the questions. Hi. Hi. Oh, wait, I don't, oh, is it on? Okay. Um, first off, I would just like to thank you for coming to speak to us. I think you're an amazing, courageous, compassionate person, and I'm so happy you could be here with us. Um, I have two questions. Um, my first question is, was there conflict between the Hutu and the Tutsi before colonialism, or was it strictly a result of colonialism? Actually, as I said, before that time, Hutus knew they were Hutus. Tutsis knew that they, they, they were Tutsis. And Hutus who could have cows could, call, could be called Tutsis. All right. And Tutsis who did not have cows and were just working on the land, farmers, they were also called Hutus. 
So there was no conflict as such. In order to divide and rule, as I said, then the colonizers dividing the people in order to rule. And my second question is, are you going to the Academy Award? <laughs> Certainly. Thank you, it's a great honor to have you here. Um, this is less a question for you, but this is an issue that needs to be addressed. You mentioned 20 years ago, America divesting from South Africa, and there's a lot of action on this campus around that issue. And it's come to my attention that the Dartmouth Endowment owns two companies that have government contracts in the Sudan. Those companies are Alcatel and Siemens. I believe I'm pronouncing them right, I might be wrong. Siemens. Um, so I just, this is, to the crowd, I just want us to all be aware of that, to begin to consider that, and to take action. Thank you very much for the information. <laughs> we, are already, we are already on the move. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you very much for coming. Welcome. Um, I would like to ask you, what do you feel about General Bismarck uh, being tried in The Hague rather than in Kigali? General Bismarck was a general as Kagame was one. Both of them were leading armies, and all armies abused human rights. That is what, among the things that Rwandese need. We need to sit around a table, talk about all that happened, how it happened, who is responsible, and then reconcile. Thank you, sir, very much. Um, uh, just one question. Looking at the historical development of poverty, um, especially in the third world, including the pockets of poverty we have here in the United States, um, what, and being that the United Nations is built into this structure of poverty, what role do you see the United Nations having in the future in such interventions in um, the third world? To me, The United Nations are a non-existing institution. <laughs> they do not have an army to start with. When it comes to interventions, the soldiers they take, in most cases, are the soldiers from the third world. And those soldiers are not going to be peacemakers, but people who are getting a better salary, a better living. So they do not take committed soldiers. And the United Nations as a whole, they can no, never take an action. I believe that the real true United Nations should be, that United Nations which are there should be reformed. And the United Nations mission should be redefined. Instead of being neutral observers, because so far, the United Nations missions are always neutral observers. From neutral, they should be reformed. From neutral observers, not to peacekeepers, but to peacemakers. I can never imagine a soldier who goes in a country Instead of protecting an innocent civilian, he just shows up in a uniform. And when you ask him, what are you doing? This person being murdered. He tells you, I'm sorry. I'm not allowed to shoot. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Yes? How is the Rwandan government dealing with uh, prosecuting those that took part in the genocide? I think the government of Rwanda should improve the way things are being done. Because the situation in Rwanda is the situation 
of a winner and a loser. Have you ever seen wrestlers? This game they call wrestling. You have seen it? <laughs> the situation of Rwanda is the situation of uh, a wrestler who lost and the one who won. The one who won is standing strong and the one who lost submitted. He's begging, please, 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 please. And the ref, and the ref doesn't want to blow the whistle. Excuse yes? me, we, we have a question back here too, excuse me. And I think I'll take um, these two. Thank you. I uh, I'm sorry. I actually have two questions. My first question is, I was wondering if you feel that if the um, radio messages had been um, extinguished or if they had been stopped, that the genocide would not have occurred. Radio Machetes was there. Actually, Radio Machetes was created by the former leaders of the nation. When they created a militia, they also created a tool to convey a message. And what was the message? Was first of all, dehumanizing human, human beings, calling them cockroaches. And once a person or a cockroach is killed, killing, killing a cockroach, an insect, is removing an infestation. And on top of that, impunity, because we talk about that radio, impunity was among the biggest problems of Rwanda since 1959 up to today. I saw in 1959, when I grew up around the 60s, I saw many people occupying houses they never built. I was told that many people were even having cattle they never, which never belonged to them. And they were having land that were not theirs. Then, because of impunity, even the leaders happened to give them, to, to change the owners of the land and the houses. Since 1959, the first Tutsi Exodus, 1973, the second, 1990, the third, and 1994, the first Hutu Exodus. I have never seen things changing in Rwanda. I have never been seen someone punished because he has had things which do not belong to him. As I, has, I told you, history keeps on repeating itself and never teaches us a lesson. Mm. I saw in 1994 when the rebels took over, people breaking the doors of the shops, going behind the counters, starting selling products they never, they never bought. I saw many people breaking the doors of houses, staying in those houses as if they, are, they were theirs. Then that hate radio, the machete radio, as you have called it, was telling people, go and kill your neighbor. If you kill him, you'll have his house, you'll have his cows, you'll have his car, you'll have his everything. And if you go back in history and remember that your uncle your father, your grandfather did the same, and he was not punished while not doing it. And yet, telling that to a poor person is very easy to convey a message. And it's said by the government officials. My, yes, please. My, I'm sorry. My second question, I was wondering uh, the tenor of the uh, Tutsi uh, community. I was wondering uh, your opinion on how they feel knowing that um, their neighbors participated in the massacre of their friends and their family, and how they're able to survive in such no, a I country. Don't, I don't get your question. Can you please repeat it? I was wondering how the Tutsi survivors are feeling at this point in time, knowing that 
certain people um, in their community um, participated in the massacre of their friends and family? Well, that one I cannot really tell you because I don't, I don't live in Rwanda. I do not know the opinion because the opinion keeps on changing. But what I can tell you is that the victims, the Tutsi victims, are now more closer to Hutus than the Tutsis who came from outside. Yes, please. Finally. Uh, <laughs> given uh, the culpability of the German and the Belgian colonizers and in creating and fostering the psychosocial construct that led to the massacre, what role have they played in the contribution uh, contribution to the reconstruction of the country, um, if any at all, and what do you feel their role should be? Well, so far, I haven't seen any role. And actually, what took place in Rwanda, the whole world turned its back. And uh, even afterwards, I did not see a lot being changed. And I think that when it comes to the role they could play, the first role colonizers should play is to bring back a lot of what they have taken and rebuild Africa. Because if they don't, if they don't, I do not know whether they have noticed that or not. Many Africans are coming to Europe, are invading Europe. What is it easier? Is it to help people within their own countries, in, within their own environment, or let them come to uh, in, invade you. So it is a matter of choice. <laughs> <laughs> Either they do it, or we come over. <laughs> <laughs> yes, madam. Oh, I just want to say thank you again for coming. I think that your life is just a testimony to the fact that one person can make a big difference. And my question actually is along the lines of what he just asked, and it's about um, the role of the West. And I'm just thinking about, like, where is the place of African, and African self rule? Like, we look back and we see the um, colonizers come in, like, spoil things. So is it a case of let them fix it themselves, or how do you make that transition from looking to the West for support, at the same time, like, letting Africa, like, stand on its own and rule itself? Just wondering about that. We've got a share of responsibilities in what is happening and what has happened on our continent. But they also have another one. That is why we need them to bring us back around the table and help, help us rebuild what has been destroyed. Thank you very much. It has been a very enjoyable evening. Thank you.